Good evening. We'd like to welcome you to Lighthouse Baptist Church this evening. And uh, we're in a little bit of a lockdown protocol this evening, and uh, we're doing our church uh, services live stream, and our pastor is out of town uh, this week. But we would like to invite you to the serv- uh, invite you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 50 tonight. And uh, we're, we're going to be doing our Wednesday night service a little bit different, uh, just through the live stream and service here. I uh, hope uh, you folks uh, have your Bibles with you. Uh, but turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 50, and uh, we're going to go ahead and open up in our text here. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4, it says this, The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He waketh morning by morning, he waketh mine ear as uh, to hear as the learned. Now, before we get into the text tonight, the book of Isaiah is a rather intimidating read for a number of reasons. Uh, th- th- this is not just a continual descriptive narrative like the Gospels. Uh, this is not uh, a meditative study uh, in, in compare and contrast like uh, the book of Proverbs, and it's not like the Psalms with, uh, with, with just this meditative meditative wisdom and uh, just pouring out heart, uh, heartfelt prayer, dedication, and things of that nature. Uh, but this is a rather intricate weaving uh, of, of God's prophetic plan for Israel. And not just for Israel, uh, but to some of the neighboring uh, uh, acquaintances and even for our future as well. So for Israel's past, present, and future, uh, we look to Isaiah. Uh, but if we want to get a quick outline and a quick grasp of what this book is, is telling us, it would help us immensely in understanding our verse of where we're at here today. Uh, Isaiah chapter 50, uh, and as we're getting to this text, we're going to look at the overview of the book in totality, uh, and it's doing about five different things here for a general outline. Uh, The first thing it does is it contains a scattered history of Israel in a complex time of division uh, with a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom and and some of the just the the trouble they faced. Uh, Secondly, it it contains a scattered history of hostile nations and kings and all what the, uh, those alliances around and all that meant for Israel as well. And the third thing it did uh, was interjecting God's judgment upon some of the lineages and nations and kings and even judgment upon Israel themselves uh, unto uh, going into captivity and things of that nature. Uh, the fourth thing it does is it contains a, a note and a message of salvation of God uh, to those taken captive and, uh, and futuristically those uh, that, would, that would come to know him by faith. And so uh, we see the salvation of God in, in the book of Isaiah. Uh, fifthly, it declares the Messiah. It declares the one that uh, would come to redeem uh, not only the nation of Israel from their sin, but also deliverance unto the Gentiles, and particularly in vivid language. Uh, The book of Isaiah contains specific details in regard to who the Messiah was and what he was going to do in terms of his life and his ministry. And it's notable to mention this was 700 years before the birth of Christ. Uh, So please keep these things in mind as we get into the message. Uh, So by the time we get to Isaiah chapter 50, a lot of this generalized outline, which kind of skips around throughout the course of the book, a lot of the outline's already been covered and delivered, uh, but Isaiah chapter 50 is a call for Israel, God's covenant nation, to consider her ways. Hey, uh, to receive the fault for their generational history and their unfaithfulness to God and and their idolatry and, and, and adopting other gods and And what we see here is in light of her sin, God still desires to assist in the process of redemption. And so uh, the Lord hints to his strong arm in the miraculous. If you look down to Isaiah chapter 50, uh, look at verse 2. It says, Behold, at my rebuke I dry up the sea. I clothe the heavens with blackness and I make sackcloth their covering and it's a a hint back to God's working all the way in Egypt and what he did for them. And then the prophetic utterance takes a turn here to go to the physical manifestation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and some of the work that he would perform in that day. Uh, Not only in that day, but also for us in the day and age in which we live. And so this is amazing uh, to think that uh, not only God would deliver 
deliver those in this particular time as covenant people, uh, but he would also deliver us. And, and as we read in verse 4, the, light, the Lord God had given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. To, he waketh morning by morning. He waketh my eye, uh, my ear to hear as the learned. And so uh, we see uh, that the, the, the shift takes place from the condemnation upon Israel and God wanting Israel to take uh, responsibility for uh, their transgression and for their iniquity just as we should. Now we see the Lord and Savior uh, being manifest through the word of prophecy uh, to, to deliver them for, them for their suffering and for our suffering as well. And in doing so, He's, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at the pattern that he shows forth through the scripture to endure whatever this world will throw our way. And, and it wasn't for his sin, all the things he endured. It was for ours uh, to redeem us, a lost and, and fallen people. And, and like I said, it's amazing uh, to take note that all this happened 700 years uh, before the birth uh, of the physical manifestation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, a couple notable things of what we will not be doing. Uh, when you're studying the book of Isaiah, it is very uh, very advantageous to study the history uh, and, to, and to understand and preach uh, the history in terms of its context. Uh, we won't necessarily be doing that in totality this evening. Also, we will not be getting into the full messianic implications of what this verse means. Uh, but what we will be doing is looking at the instruction for righteousness in regard to the church and the believer for today. And so if I had to title this message, Message. I, I, I would like to preach a message to you this evening titled, Trust in God for Rock Solid Faith. Trust in God for Rock Solid Faith. Let's open up in a word of prayer and then we'll get into the message this evening. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you and praise you for your grace, for your peace, for your mercy, for your love. We do pray for our church family today, uh, those that may be tra traveling, those out of town, uh, those that may be sick and afflicted, uh, Lord, Lord, those that would desire to be here and can't be here. Uh, we do ask, Lord, that you would uh, put a special hedge of protection around them this evening. I pray that you would help your church through the uh, preaching of your word. I pray that you'd help deliver uh, deliver your message through me, a conduit, a willing channel and vessel of what you want to do. Lord, we're trusting you this evening. We're in desperate need uh, for you to, uh, to speak to our hearts and uh, to change us from the inside out. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the ministry of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we ask you to do great and mighty things that we know not this evening in the hearts of the hearer. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen and amen. All right, as we look at this uh, subject in hand tonight, uh, uh, being able to trust God for rock-solid faith, we see this pattern right here uh, through the life of our uh, Lord Jesus Christ here. And as we look at the subject at, at hand, I'd also like to examine Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. He states this, he says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So Paul says, said, look, you can look at unto Paul as the pattern, but he says, the real pattern's Jesus. Only follow me as I follow Jesus. And so Paul emphatically declares that uh, Jesus Christ is the pattern. And what we're doing tonight is looking at some of the patterns uh, that Jesus had in his practical life of how he followed the Father in faith. Now, as we look at this text, we'll see where the Lord Jesus got his steadfast resolve, uh, where he got his calm repose from and what he intended to do. Now, as we're here, uh, we're, we look at our own flesh and we say, hey, uh, we're not like Jesus uh, in, in a lot of ways, but I will tell you this, if you turn to Luke chapter 2, verse 52, there's something important I'd like to show you uh, before we get started here. Jesus relegated himself to the same pattern of learning and education in the flesh just as we're subject to. Luke chapter 2, verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Note the recipient of the message was to the weary. Now, Jesus, he, he, he had to learn the same way we do and he had to increase in knowledge the same way we do and he got to the point of where he was so full, he increased in stature, uh, in wisdom with God and, and with man, uh, he was growing in his faith. Sometimes we get the wrong idea uh, that the Lord Jesus uh, was, was born 
knowing all things. Hey, he could have, uh, but he chose to be subject to the flesh. He was complete God and complete man. He chose to humble himself uh, and be obedient uh, to the Father through the flesh and even under the death of the cross. And so as he's growing in grace and knowledge and wisdom, uh, he got a message to carry forth. And who is his message to? His message was to the weary, just as we looked at in our opening text. Hey, who are the weary? Uh, the weary are those whose strength has been exhausted by toil, whose strength has been exhausted by fatigue, uh, not only in this life, but also at other burdensome times. Hey, we find ourselves without strength. We find ourselves uh, without courage. Uh, but here, uh, we found ourselves in good company. Uh, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And uh, the Lord Jesus came uh, to strengthen those that needed it. Uh, he came to strengthen those that needed a lasting help, those that needed refreshing, uh, and, and those that needed an enduring source uh, for their time of need and their time of trouble. As we look in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, uh, the Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, uh, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He had sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Hey friend, are you weary today? Are you weary? Good news, God has a word for you in this exact hour. The thing that you have that is most needful for you in your own heart and life, God has a word for you in this day and age. Uh, last night at our Hope for Addiction class, uh, there was a young man that stayed and talked to us after, and I was able to share a word, a testimony, uh, that something I would went through, that how God had showed me in the word. And we flipped over uh, to the book of Ecclesiastes, and we flipped over to Proverbs 23, and he says, hey, that's exactly where I'm at. That's exactly where I'm at. You know, the Lord God, He waketh morning by morning, and, and, and he, he, he waketh mine ear to hear as the learned. And He's learned, what did He learn to do? How to speak a word in season to them that are weary. If you're weary today, God has a word for you in this exact hour, this day and age in which we live. Now, in light of looking at uh, not only what Christ was to do and the pattern that he laid forth and, and, and the focus of who this message was to go to is to the weary, is to us. And one of the greatest needs of the weary uh, is, is salvation. If you're unsaved today and you're living a life of sin and you know not Christ, then the, you, you, I'm sure to say that you're weary, friend. And you need to, to repent and put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. But also, uh, if you're going through this life, even as a Christian, this life can get weary at times. I can't remember a more pressing time in my 41 years to think back, just so many health complications with folks that I know, uh, so many financial needs of folks that I know, uh, people going through valleys of decision in all manner and type and sort. Ministries are having uh, trouble uh, being able to do what they need to do. And it's definitely a wearisome time. But in light of examining the text with the thought in mind that we're trusting God for a rock-solid faith, let's look back at our, this notable text from Isaiah 50 uh, to, to see what stood and sustained Jesus uh, upon His time in the earth. Now, the first thing I want to look at is the fact that we need help in our speech to obtain a rock-solid faith. Not in our wisdom, not in our intellect, uh, not in our own performance. I want you to look down at Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4. It says this, The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He waketh morning by morning, he waketh mine ear to hear as the learned. Uh, do we desire the tongue of the learned? James chapter uh, 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. God's given wisdom to anybody that will want it. He will not rebuke you. He will not chastise you. He will give you as much as you can handle. He will fill you to the brim with his wisdom. And it says, And it shall be given him. But note, the desire to hear was present. You know, God's given us two ears and one mouth. 
I think that's almost symbolic at times uh, where God says, let, let man be swift to hear and slow to speak. Now, uh, the Lord Jesus uh, was listening for direction from the Father for the specific purpose of doing what? Directing His speech. And what was He going to do with that speech? He was going to take that speech and then minister to the weary to give them a word in due season. Now, the object of speech wasn't initially judgment, but it was to actually comfort those that were discouraged, those that were spent, those who were exhausted, those that were fatigued. Uh, the manner of this text gives reference to an overplowed ox or a weary traveler. That's the type of weariness uh, that he, he, he desired to minister to. So uh, we understand that if we're going to have rock-solid faith, we need help in our speech. As we see the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, uh, He says, God, the Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned. That's where it came from. He said, I didn't have it within myself. Could He have used uh, uh, some of His supernatural uh, powers of, and His Godship and His Godhead to be able to do this? Absolutely He could. Uh, but He subject Himself uh, to be obedient uh, to the Father and to the flesh, to be completely man. And if we look closely at the supporting verses here, uh, we'll see obedience was part of the equation. Hey, the Messiah didn't turn back at the hardness of the revelation. You say, what was the revelation? Hey, it changes from time, time to time. So many people draw back from hard preaching and teaching. I'm not just talking about loud or flamboyant, but I'm talking about when sin is illuminated in your heart and life or something that your flesh is desiring that God wants you to draw back from. He didn't draw back. Sin wasn't found in him, and he was able to continue to build on his faith, virtue, and virtue, knowledge, and all these other fruits of the Spirit, and, and being able to be a partaker of that divine nature. And so, uh, whenever us here in the flesh, we hear things that come against our flesh, a lot of times there's an impasse. We refuse to follow God, uh, and we hit a roadblock, uh, we, we refuse to do what God says, and we end up having an impasse. But Jesus said, The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. Hey, his hearing led him to doing. He heard and he didn't rebel. So many people in churches today, uh, they're struggling uh, because they're rebelling. Uh, they're rebelling to be against what God has said, what God has asked of them. And they're going to come to an impasse. And they're looking for rock solid faith and they'll not have it. Why? Because they've not opened their ear. They've closed it to God. Now Luke chapter 6 verse 45 tells us this. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. If we want a tongue of the learned and the tongue of the wise of the tongue uh, that God wants us to have, not only do we have to hear, not only do we have to be obedient, uh, we have to have a heart to receive it. What's needed from us? We need an open ear, a willing tongue, an obedient heart. You see how this works? What happens is when we speak forth the word of truth that God gives us, surely goodness, this is going to flow forth from us and then all things will be well, right? That's not right. It may be well with us and God, but what happens next? If somebody has rock solid faith and they have this understanding of the learned and they start speaking it and going forth and they're not rebellious to God and they go out into the sin cursed world to deliver what he's told them to deliver, hard times are coming, which brings us to our second point. Not only are we going to need help in our speech and help in our tongue and help in our hearing, we're going to need help in our affliction. And I'm not talking about just our reactionary response. You know, when hard times come, immediately uh, we assume that we're out of the will of God and uh, we end up taking the will and uh, we think there's something wrong with our faith and we abandon the disciplines that got us to this point. And sometimes that's the wrong response. Now, I'm not talking about the chastisement of God, and I'm not talking about uh, suffering for, for sin. I'm talking about suffering for uh, the cause of Christ. Uh, but, but again, an observation to Christ's example, I want you to turn back to Isaiah chapter 50, and I want you to look in verse 6 for a second. He says this. He says, I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheek to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting, 
For the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded, therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. Our Lord was willing to trust the Father even in the midst of affliction. Even in the midst uh, of affliction, He knew who He believed. Hey, the scriptures tell us he was not confused. He was not confounded. He was not perplexed. What was he? He was focused on the word of the Father. He was focused on the Father. Hey, David had this same calm repose in the way he conducted his life and his manner of living. Uh, though he was not perfect, he did fall from time to time and scripture records some of his failures. Uh, but David was a man after God's own heart. And in Psalm 121 verse 1, he tells us I will lift mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help my help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth he will not suffer thy foot to be moved he that keepeth thee will not slumber uh, David had the assurance that God would help him in the midst of his affliction and we see that through scripture Christ uh, he, he had the calm assurance that God would help him in his affliction even in the midst of smiters even in the midst of those that would physically uh, defile him he hid not his face from the shame and from the spitting why? because he knew his Lord his God would help him if we're going to have rock solid faith we need to understand that type of help in the midst of our affliction not taking the will, uh, not trying to figure things out in our own strength, but to be able to simply trust in God in the manner that Christ did here. Which brings us to our, our third point here. We need help in the midst of our defense if we're going to have rock-solid faith. Help in the midst of our defense, not in our alliances, not in our wealth, not in our reputation. As some people uh, that, 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 that fall in the midst of calamity, they try to, uh, to heap to themselves all different manner of people uh, to help bail them out of their court cases or, or, or prayer help or whatever it may be. And those things may be fine and good, but in the deepest, darkest hour, uh, Paul often stood alone. In Christ's deepest, darkest hour, he stood alone as well. And in verse 8 of Isaiah 50, the Bible tells us he is not near that justifieth me who will contend with me let us stand together who is my adversary let him come near to me behold the Lord God will help me who is he that shall condemn me uh, you see if you want rock solid faith uh, you need to have the calm assurance that God is your alliance God is your protection hey one man with God is a majority did you hear that one man with God is a majority who is it going to be uh, to, uh, to charge any of God's elect? Who is it going to bring a, a railing accusation against those that are blood-bought, those saved by the precious blood of Christ? Romans chapter 8 tells us, uh, Therefore now there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If you're walking after the Spirit of God and you find yourself in the midst of persecution or slander or sickness or whatever it may be, uh, God is your help, He is your refuge, He is your defense. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ uh, thought as much as well. And He says, Who is He that shall condemn me? Let Him come near. Lo, they shall all wax old as garment. The moth shall eat them up. And, and whenever you feel like all is lost, listen to verse 10. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obey the voice of His servants, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? And let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. Behold, all ye that kindle a fire, that compass yourself with sparks and walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks that you have kindled, this shall ye have of mine hand and you shall lie down in sorrow. Uh, when a man tries to walk in his own light and he's walking after the flesh like we just read in Romans chapter 8, uh, there's going to be failure, there's going to be condemnation. But for those that's walking after the Spirit with their faith and trust in a living God and our living hope in the blood of Christ, our, our prayer is that uh, that David prayed in Psalm 109. He said, Help me, O Lord, my God, and save me according to thy mercy. Uh, when we ask God to help us, you know, we're not asking God to do it according to our plan, according to our wisdom, according to our design. We're asking Him to do it according to His specific design He has set for us, according to His mercy. 
So we need God in the midst of affliction, in the midst of our defense. Uh, we need him to teach us how to speak and how to hear. Uh, th this and this alone is the only way we're ever going to have rock solid faith. Do you notice a pattern here? We're not trusting in the arm of flesh. We're not trusting the intellect and the wisdom of man. Uh, we're not trusting in self. We're not trusting in others. But we're trusting in the God of heaven to deliver us from all manner of evil to direct our steps. The fourth and last thing I want to look at here is help in the midst of our cowardice. Uh, whenever we look at uh, the things that come against man, as, as particularly in regard to our defense and physical affliction, uh, what happens? Our strength becomes very small. We become weak. We become trembling. Hey, uh, we don't trust in the arm of the flesh like we already said before. Who do we trust in? We trust in the God of our salvation. We trust in the Father. We trust in our Bible. We trust in prayer. We trust in the God that can deliver. Now I want to show you something here. We're going to skip a couple verses and jump over to Isaiah chapter 51, verse 1. And it says, Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness. Ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock from which ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit from which ye are digged. Look unto Abraham your father, and to Sarah that bare you. I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving in the voice of melody. Uh, when you look at Isaiah chapter 50 verse 7, the Bible says, For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. When you see what Jesus did in his time of need, what did he do? He was going up to Jerusalem. If you understand the context of when he set his face like a flint, I think we got to turn back to Luke chapter 9 to see the context of whenever he fulfilled uh, this scripture here in Matthew 27. Luke 9.51 states, And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He knew his death was imminent. He knew his sacrifice uh, was imminent. And he knew what, what laid ahead of him that was prophetically written here in Isaiah chapter 50. And Matthew 27 gives us a little bit more insight what happened when he got there. Matthew 27 verse 12. And when he was accused of the chief priest and the elders answering nothing. Then Pilate said unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered to him, Never a word, insomuch that the governor marvel, marveled greatly. Hey, he didn't need to say a word. He understood that the God that would sanctify him, the God that would justify him, the Father that would glorify him was near, as we read previously. And so if you want to have rock-solid faith, you need to set your face like a flint toward whatever God's laid out for you. Uh, whatever challenges, whatever uh, wars and, and, and things that come against you, uh, we don't need to be fear-driven in this world. When you're fear-driven, what happens is, is God's prompt into service. Uh, we shrink back and we may miss it. Uh, we shrink back and we say, God, I can't do that. The fear of man, the fear, fear of devils, the fear of just not having enough faith, it shakes us. And uh, we think about what may happen and all the could have, would have, should have end up, we have regrets later on in life. Uh, but God wants us to take courage. He wants us to take, take us to go to battle and not take us out of the battle. Fear and, and, and a guilt in just a, a, a guilt-driven life literally will remove you from the battlefield of where God wants you to be. It will prevent you from taking ground that God has commanded us to take. And, and if you look at it in totality, it's really fear from following God. Now, Jesus was able to stand in the midst of being alone and in the midst of physical affliction. Why? Simply because he believed the word of God. Now, we, we look at long-time servants, those that's been in ministry for a long time, even the, uh, the patriarchs of the faith, and we look and say, hey, I could never have the faith of David. I could never build that type of ministry. I could never go there. I could never do this. But if you look back to what Scripture tells us, David wasn't just thrown in to fight in Goliath immediately. 
If you look back at the pattern of David's life, there was a bit of preparation. Hey, he was dutiful in the home. He was possibly given a lamb. He was given a flock. He was trusted in, 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 the, in the late hours with the flock and the herd, in the early morning hours that been, would be most dangerous. He was found uh, uh, zealous to defend his pasture against the lion and the bear as a young man. He was trusted to go to the edge of battle uh, to be able to deliver provisions uh, to those brothers that, that were fighting in war. And he looked around and noticed, hey, is there not a cause that no one would submit to? He looked back at his weaponry and the past provisions God made for him and he thought back to the God of the Psalms, the God that inspired song, the meditations of his heart from the Word. God prepared him for that day. And as we look at the pattern of Christ, uh, that he rose up in the morning uh, to give ear to God. He did not rebel to what the Father would tell him. He went forth and had to learn tongue. He went forth to speak uh, to those that were weary. And he took uh, the, the, the small things and built upon the foundation little by little by little. And if we're going to have a rock solid faith, we're going to have to do the same thing. Now, I want you to look at our verse here. Isaiah chapter 51 verse 1. The second part, it says, Look unto the rock which ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit which ye are digged. Do you know you're made of stronger things? A lot of times people shrink back in the day of adversity, and they shrink back whenever challenges come. But we're made of stronger things. And you may say, well, I'm made of flesh. That's not strong. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the living hope that we're built on. We're made of a, of a rock that was hewn not by hands, but by the will of God. Uh, the, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was the chief cornerstone that the builders rejected and God had made Him head of the corner. Now, that's where our lively faith is built on. Hey, we're made of stronger things than you can imagine. Think about the rock in which you're cut. If you look at the context here, uh, it goes back to the history of those that put their faith and trust in God, Abraham and Sarah. And it makes me think about the history of Hebrew chapter 11, uh, the heroes of faith and uh, the hall of faith here. You look at Enoch and the fact that he pleased God in the midst of a perverse world. Uh, you look at the faith of Noah uh, that warned uh, the, the nations and was a preacher of righteousness and made uh, preparation for safety. You look at Sarah and Abraham as they uh, made provision to go to a place they knew not. You see the pattern here? They're resting in God. They're seeking God. Hey, Jacob had, had, had faith, rock-solid faith, that my life needs to change. My old trickster nature, uh, the supplanter nature, uh, my own way of doing things need to be corrected uh, because I believe in God. Uh, the faith of Joseph that was utterly consistent, whether it was in jail, whether it was in slavery, whether it was in temptation, or whether it was in forgiveness, because his faith and trust was in a living hope. Hey, think about the faith of Joshua. He had faith to go forth to war and to conquer, uh, not in the arm of flesh, but in the arm and the word of God. Hey, think about the faith of Rahab, that cleansing faith, the faith that, uh, that helped her uh, through that prideful living, that lustful living, the faith that cleaned her, cleansed her, put her in the lineage of our Lord. Now this is not something that's conjured up for within man. And this is not something that you can learn enough about uh, to be able to, uh, to have intellect in your brain uh, to be able to figure this out. This is going to have to come from another source. This is going to have to come from just simply trusting God, believing God at His Word and taking Him at face value. If you look further on through Hebrews chapter 11, uh, starting at verse 36, and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned and they were sawed asunder. They were tempted and were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. This type of faith and courage gave the Messiah strength to endure death, even the death of the cross. And the secret to all this, like we said previously, it's not, not in our own strength. It's resting in the strength of, the, of another. It's resting in the Word of God. It's allowing His strength to become ours. You want rock-solid faith? You'll not build it yourself. You'll not conjure it up. It comes from simply casting 
your lot and your life into the lap of God. Believe in His Word, trusting in Him. The rock in which we anchor to is His Word. That's where our faith is. That's where obedience is. Hebrews 13, 5 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For He has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I want to ask you this evening, do you have this type of confidence? Do you have this type of confidence? Do you have a rock solid faith? Is your ear willing to hear what God wants to, to do in your heart and life to change you? Is your mouth ready to speak that which He gives you? You build on your faith bit by bit based on obedience. And you say, I could never do the things of these Christian saints of old. Or I could never do what some of these uh, folks in, 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 in the early church history have done. Maybe not, maybe, maybe so. Maybe God has other things for you. But don't let it be because you don't have faith to withstand and faith to endure. Do you have confidence that this is your type of faith? Maybe you're not saved this evening. Maybe, maybe you need to take that weary life and surrender it uh, to a crucified Christ. Maybe you need to put your faith and trust in His finished work. Then you'll be ready to hear and you'll be ready to speak. Hey, do you have faith in the midst of affliction, in the midst of slander, in the midst of being outnumbered? Do you try to, to vindicate your own self? Do you try to give vengeance back toward those that may have offended you? What about when the weariness gets to a point when it seems all is lost and, and, and you're all alone? Here's what we do. We follow the pattern of the Redeemer from the Scripture in which we looked at here. We trust God to give us rock solid faith. Jesus Christ laid the pattern. He continually sought the assistance of the Father. He will give. All throughout Isaiah 50, He will give. He will open. He will help. It says again in chapter 7, He will help. It's uh, In verse 7, in verse 9, He says, The Lord God will help me. It goes on and on and on. In, in, in Christ, He came to the conclusion that God was near. Do you truly believe He's near to you? Are you close to Him? You only get close through obedience and through knowing Him and His Word. To close out the service this evening, I want to look at, at a scripture we already looked at once. It's Isaiah 50, verse 10. It says, Who is he or who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of a servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. Our faith is not placed in our performance, our time, our talents, our treasures, our wit and our wisdom. Our faith is placed and stayed upon the Lord our God. John Newton lived a, 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 a wicked life in his early years. He wrote that amazing hymn, uh, Amazing Grace, that we sing in churches from time to time. And he wrote another hymn of where he captures the spirit of Isaiah chapter 50, leading up to verse, uh, chapter 51. He, he says, Be gone unbelief, my Savior is near, and for my relief will surely appear. By prayer let me wrestle, and he will perform. With Christ in the vessel, I smile at the storm. Though dark be my way, since he is my God, tis mine to obey to his to provide. Though cisterns be broken and cre creatures all fail, the words he has spoken shall surely prevail. Do you have a living hope in the manner and pattern of what we see here? Is your faith rock solid? Do you follow what our Lord and Savior put into practice? If not, I pray this evening you put consideration upon these verses. You look over them again in the secret place. You'd ask God, Lord, will you strengthen my faith in this manner? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you and praise you for your grace, for your peace, for your mercy, for your love. We thank you for the pattern of Christ and the Apostle Paul, Lord, that we desire to pattern our own life after. And Lord, we need help in our affliction. We need help in guarding our tongue. Lord, we need help in assisting us in all manner of evil. 
And Lord, we need help in our cowardice. There's so many things that you desire for us to do. And Lord, we, we ask that you'd give us faith to believe, go forth, and give us faith to conquer and to, and to proclaim your name. Uh, if there's any out there tonight, Lord, that may uh, be listening by way of internet, Lord, I pray that you would help uh, deal with their heart in the manner in which they need most. Uh, th Lord, I pray that you would speak a word in season to those that are weary. Help strengthen our faith and, and, and may it be rock solid. Uh, and at your appearing, Lord, may we be found faithful. We thank you and praise you for what you're going to do. And we do continually pray for those uh, traveling in our church, those sick and afflicted. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would just uh, see these things in your blessed will and way. We thank you and praise you for what you're going to do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you.